Perfect. Thank you, Leah. And um, welcome to everyone who's on the webinar. You are um, extremely welcome and we're grateful for you uh, that you've made some time to join us this morning. As Leah said, this is going to be an hour maximum. The, the vision and the ambition for uh, these Leah webinars is that it's an hour of really valuable and condensed content. Um, after today, we'll be sharing on the website. So if you have to leave halfway through, please don't worry, it'll be on the LEA website and you can access it yourself likewise. Uh, if any of the speakers are particularly interesting to you, it will be uh, an option that you can share it with team after the event. We've got two LEA speakers uh, and two external speakers. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from them all. Before we begin, uh, um, and our first speaker is Ben, head of technical here at LEA, just a reminder about uh, Leah's LiftX show, which you'll see on the screen here is October 5th and 6th. Uh, this year it's up in Aberdeen, the oil and gas capital of Europe. Um, if you can make it, please come along. It'll be, as it ever is, a really important chance to meet, network with the industry, maybe for one of the first times in the last couple of years. And just a reminder that the Leah Awards <clears throat> happen on the 5th. The evening of the 5th, we'll be having a gala dinner. Um, the award category uh, website is already open. You can find it just by Googling Lee Awards. So without further ado, we're going to move into our presentations. Uh, ben, I hope you're ready. We're excited about hearing from you. Uh, and so I'll pass over to Ben Dobbs, Head of Technical Services here at the Association. Excuse me, just one moment while I just set up my um, slides. Right, apologies for that. Can everybody see my um, slides now? Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Benjamin Dobbs and I am the head of uh, LEA Technical Services. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of what we are currently doing on standardization um, specific to the oil and gas industries. Well, first, however, I'd like to give you a quick introduction to LEA um, Technical Services and what we do and how we do it. I manage a team of three experts um, that between us deal with all aspects of lifting from below the hook equipment to lifting machines through design, manufacture, inspection, maintenance, and for examination and use. Uh, we're basically responsible for LEA's interpretation of standards and legislation worldwide. We're also responsible for providing our membership with technical support and guidance, as well as keeping them informed of change before it occurs and support them to adapt well before the competition. Finally, we represent LEA member interests on the development of legislation, standards and industry best practices. So how do we do all of this? Well, this graphic sort of explains the trade association and highlights where we sit within it most of which is pretty much behind the scenes and are the areas highlighted here in yellow. Uh, but we do interface with the membership through three different ways. These are the green boxes on the right-hand side. On the top and the bottom, um, the, the, the main parts that you'll be familiar with are the member engagement um, and the learning development teams. They're working closely within our membership at different levels. They feed back anything of relevance to us that they encounter on a daily basis, but we also feed back anything new to them to help them continuously improve and develop the training material and the auditing processes. On the very far right, uh, we have our direct communication with the membership. Uh, members are free to consult with us through our triage system um, on a wide variety of industry issues and we help them to find the best possible solutions to any problems that they may have. Over the years, we've managed to accumulate a considerable amount of knowledge, and as such, we are able to answer most questions immediately. However, there is always something new, and in order to solve a problem, 
we turn to our resource, which is the knowledge generator in the center, as we like to call it. Once a solution is found, um, it sometimes means a change to standards and legislation until we are able to resolve the issue. So as you can see, there is a constant flow of information that we deal with that on one side benefits our members in terms of technical support and guidance. And on the other side, we are in a position to continuously improve standards and legislation for the better and the benefit of our members. So in essence, this is how we are lifting standards worldwide. This is some uh, of the data uh, we record from our triage service. Um, I wanted to show you this as it, uh, oops, as it highlights, um, I wanted to show you this as it, uh, how effective the service can be in helping us to respond to industry issues and rectify them through support guidance standards or even changes to legislation. If you look at the, uh, the bar chart um, from in the years 2020 to 2021, which are the origin gray uh, bars on the graph, you can see that the number of inquiries increased dramatically in the early part of these years. The reason for this were concerns over COVID-19 and how to operate um, during, during the restrictions that were imposed by that. But also in the UK, there were issues concerning the UK's withdrawal from the EU. In response to these, we produce guidance documents and also work with the authorities to make certain industry practice allowances. This effectively solved many of the problems and resulted in the inquiries dropping, as you can see, uh, down to normal levels uh, within, the, within the graph. So really, this is a clear demonstration of how a trade association can work with its members to benefit its members in terms of their ability to continue to run profitable and safe organisations. The solution to specific problems is, is not the only way that the triage system benefits its members. Through it, we are able to get an overview of the common industry problems that, that then not only help us to improve standards, but also we learn in one industry can help us to improve another industry. So since its launch in 2019, we have made some significant improvements to the broad range of standards and industry practices. So for the offshore industry, our triage system has identified some flaws in some key standards, uh, and we've taken the initiative to improve the following standards. The first is EM13155, which is non-fixed load lifting attachments. The second is the EM13157, which is hand power cranes. And then we also have some codes of practice for the safe use of cranes, which are covered by the BS7121 uh, parts 211 and part 11. In anticipation of the publication of these works, but also in response to our members, we've revised uh, and republished our LEA 033 guidance. And we are currently uh, improving the COP uh, to include some current offshore practices and a, a 9.1 edition will be published on our website very soon. My next few slides will briefly inform you of some of the specific detail of the publications. So with respect to EM13155 non-fixed load lifting attachments, LEA are taking the lead on this standard and are working with the EU experts of send TC147WG21. The standard covers a variety of attachments, but of most relevance would be the spreader beams and perhaps some grabs. The current version of the standard has errors associated with the test factors for spreader beams. These are significant and mean that you cannot really design a spreader beam to this standard. We're advising LEA members um, to use the older version as it is more complete than, and offers an adequate enough guidance to comply with the legal requirements. Alternatively, uh, there is also the ISO 17096 standard, which is the equivalent international standard to the older version of EM13155. Our primary objective on the development of this standard is to fix the errors uh, that are associated with it. But we're also using it as an opportunity to introduce a more pragmatic design approach to the design. And we're introducing a sliding scale to the design factor similar to the ILO uh, 152 convention. This will then harmonize the standard with those requirements and, and allow break down barriers to trade um, further afield across the EU uh, and, and the world. Apologies. <laughs> The next standard is, is EM13157, uh, which covers a range of equipment commonly used in the offshore environments, such as hand chain blocks, lever hoists, and manual winches. 
The original standard was a compromise which sought to accommodate the varying practices throughout Europe. Leah was always concerned that it did not adequately cover the essential health and safety requirements of, as a result. Also, the quality of the standard was questionable, particularly some of the verification requirements, which lacked detail um, required to ensure repeatable results. The illustrations within the standards are also very poor, and Leah will be providing illustrations for the standard. Finally, the standard reflects the technology of over a decade ago, uh, since when manufacture of many products within the scope had moved outside of Europe, and the products and manufacturing methods um, have evolved with great, greater emphasis on, on portability and cost. There, there are new ISO standards for fine tolerance chain, uh, which is the TH and VH chains, uh, which are used for many manufacturers in preference to the European standards, which only cover grade eight. So we'll be updating the standards to cover grade 10 and higher grades of chain. BS712 on it is a code of practice for the safe use of cranes. Uh, part 11 covers offshore cranes. It covers competency for lifting operations using offshore cranes. The current version is seriously out of date and we believe uh, very much underutilized. Therefore, we are preparing a business case to revise the standard. We, are already, we already have much interest in participation in the development from, from the authorities and uh, LEA member organizations and other stakeholders. So if any members would like to get involved, then please let us know as soon as possible. The second part of that standard is, is, is a code of practice which covers inspection, maintenance and full examination of offshore cranes. And to our knowledge, there is currently no such standard that we are aware of that covers such things in specific detail for offshore cranes. Uh, the BS7121 series covers these requirements on all of the crane types, such as tower cranes, mobile cranes and loader cranes. Uh, and and in, in the UK, it is a quasi-legal standard. So it's a very important standard and uh, it's one that we, we, we really want to get out there. So we are preparing a business case uh, to develop this standard in response to memory requests and, and to avoid incidents. And again, we're appealing to support in the development of this part of the series. So if any members are interested in contributing, uh, we, would like, uh, we would like to hear from you. Finally, we have the LEAR Industry Best Practice Guidance. Uh, we've got LEAR 033, which is the Code of Practice for Selection, Management, Use, Maintenance and Examination of Hand Chain Hoists uh, and Lever Hoists in an Offshore Environment, including Subsea. It was originally created in response to research by the authorities into a series of incidents uh, involving hand chain hoists and lever hoists in the offshore industry. This latest version improves on the original requirements of the guide and implements the state of the art practices and technologies. Despite that offshore and subsea environments are characterized by corrosive conditions, extremes of temperature and frequent use of lifting equipment up to a maximum capacity, the research revealed that widespread use of the standard industrial products not specifically designed for the rigors of marine applications. The standard of maintenance and management procedures was also found to vary widely. Selecting lifting equipment most suited for the environment can obviously mitigate some of the additional risks inherent in offshore applications. However, good maintenance, examination, inspection, transportation, storage and control procedures are equally important. The code addresses all of these areas. Alongside offshore applications, it may also be of value to other industries uh, characterised by arduous operating environments. The guidance which is here is available to purchase from our online store. The LEA Copshield uh, is a similar document, but covers general purpose requirements for a wide range of lifting equipment and is continuously updated and revised to ensure that it is maintained uh, as most up-to-date and best practice documents of its kind. A new version is currently being developed and will be published um, very soon. The document is available as a free download, and as such, I highly recommend that you obtain a copy and work to its principles. We will also consider any improvements or any suggestions for the content. So please feel free to offer us any feedback on the document.
Thank you for your time. Um, and I think, as Leah said, I think we'll take questions um, towards the end of the presentation. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, seeing some questions come in the chat, we'll address those uh, right at the end, or if not, we'll come back to you um, by email. Um, I think that the three points that I took from that, and Evie were coming to you uh, just after I finished. Um, so the, th the three points I took were the technical advice service that Leah offers to its members. It's being utilized, but we encourage members who aren't aware of it to use it. It's a great service that Ben and his team uh, offer to our members. The email address is technicaladvice at leahint.com. That goes straight to the technical team and it'll be dealt with. Guaranteed within 48 hours, usually within two. So usually, uh, if it's within working hours, you'll get a response when you're still on site. And that, that response is produced in such a way that um, you can certainly share it with customers uh, or with internal colleagues so that they get an authoritative response to a question. Um, the second part is the guidance documents that Leah produces and has on its website. Look, take some time to um, get used to the LEA website. There is an absolute raft of information that we're really proud of. Um, please help yourself to that. Have a look at it and see what um, is of interest. And the third point that Ben made was we're doing a lot of work. And if you're interested in supporting that work on our standards, please get in touch with Ben directly. Um, the value of a trade association is its members. And so we look forward to your comments, criticisms, and challenges. And whilst I say we look forward to them, please direct them all to Ben uh, and he'll work with you to take them forward. So we'll move on now. Um, I see some hands up. We'll, we'll come to the questions at the very end. And um, we'll move on to a um, presentation from Evie Maffini. She's gonna be speaking to us about uh, digitizing lifting operations in the oil and gas industry, something that's particularly of interest in the post-COVID world. So Evie, over to you. Yes, hello everybody. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you. Here we go. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, fantastic. We're good. Just one moment. So what I'm, um, so my name is Evie Maffini and I'm the head of uh, inspection sales at Onyx. Uh, for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, we are a software company that provides a cloud-based platform where equipment owners, inspectors, and suppliers uh, digitally share and create and deliver information about equipment. But today I'm going to talk about digitizing lifting inspections in the oil and gas industry. Uh, first off, I will look at the common challenges uh, there are for the goal. Uh, oil and gas companies, mainly concerning lifting equipment regulations, documentation, and the time and cost spent on inspections. Um, I will also talk about how digitizing the inspections and equipment handling can increase efficiency and safety. And at the end, I will uh, do a presentation on a case study that we did with the rig company, uh, comparing the time spent on inspections with and without the use of an online app. So, here we go. Um, the common challenges in the oil and gas industry. Well, thousands of lifting accessories and other potential dangerous work equipment items are used every day. There are plenty of rules and regulations in place to ensure safe use of equipment and to prevent work accidents. Lawler and Puver are central regulations in the UK, in addition to the Machinery Directive and the Local Health and Safety Acts. Different parts of these rules apply to different stakeholders in the lifting ecosystem, from the producer to the supplier to the employer and through periodic inspections. Complying with these regulations can be very time consuming and difficult, especially if it's handled in a manual manner. So another barrier to digitizing uh, this is all stakeholders have manual input in their own separate systems, which means that everyone duplicates equipment information and documents about the same items. And each company has 
uh, multiple systems that do not communicate with each other. This can lead to both double registration and deficient overview. When some of these systems are closed for the end user, so the worker, they don't get access to the right documents and risk doing a task wrong and unknowingly cause an accident. And there's plenty of example where this leads to accidents. So why should you digitize uh, the lifting inspections? Well, first of all, it's to increase efficiency. Avoid duplication or missing registration of data. There's too much time spent on registration in several uh, systems. It's also to improve the safety. There are so many regulations to comply with. So a digital tool can make it easier to comply with those. Um, avoid work accidents by having detailed information about equipment readily available for the end user. Information such as when was the last inspection and what was the results of that inspection? Is the equipment safe to use and how should I use it? That's also by providing the user manual digitally. Um, a safe working environment is uh, what we all strive for and maintaining a good reputation as a safe workplace is key to business growth. And uh, a point that a, a lot of us uh, like a lot is saving money. Um, inspections can be time consuming and time is money. Traditionally, an uh, inspector spends too much time documenting the inspection, filling out the checklist with pen and paper, going back to the office to register the results, create the documentation and distribute the documentation to the client. By going digital, a lot of money can be saved on the documenting inspection part. So just a, a illustration on how a collaboration and data sharing can work to your advantage when both the supplier and the equipment owner and the inspection company work on the same platform. First of all, you have the, um, the supplier of the lifting equipment. They supply the equipment to the oil and gas uh, company uh, and with this equipment, traditionally, it follows three documents, the declaration of conformity, the certificate and the user manual. These documents and equipment information is directly sent to the owner's account um, through the system. There we go. Uh, when it's time uh, for the annual inspection, the third party inspection company is already linked to the oil and gas uh, company and can access the equipment details and the documents. When the inspection is completed, new documents and updates are sent back to the uh, owner's account. And then also the workers have the access and the information they need about the equipment and have the opportunity to maintain the equipment as well. That's just an illustration for you. So going to the case study, uh, we did a case study with COSOL uh, and we compared how much time could be saved by working traditionally with pen and paper and by using offline app to complete the inspections. So uh, the case was we tested this on two similar rigs with the same amount of lifting equipment on board and the same inspection company, but the inspectors were given different tools to um, complete the inspections. And the results were Rig X had three inspectors. They worked on a more traditional work process where they had pen and paper, paper checklists. And after they had completed uh, the checklist, they went back to the office space and completed then uh, the documentation and distributed it uh, through Onyx work there, but not using um, the, the app. Uh, they completed um, all of the lifting equipment inspections in three weeks. But on rig Y, there were only two inspectors. They were working in a more modern work process and using a dig digital checklist on the Onyx uh, inspection app. They work offline, uh, so it's um, possible to use it on the platforms, whether uh, if there is no uh, 
no network uh, and sent all the information back to Onyx work when they were done. They completed everything in two weeks. So the results are then, or the reward is five man weeks saved. And that uh, in the offshore world is a lot of money. Uh, so they reduced the time to uh, document the inspection by 55% by doing it in this uh, manner. So I spoke very fast. I think I, I didn't uh, make my 10 minutes, but um, just a, a little last food for thought. Um, it's no longer the big beating the small, but the fast beating uh, the slow. Uh, so you need to keep up with uh, with uh, the way the world is moving and uh, consider digitalizing uh, your uh, work processes. So on that note, thank you for listening to me. And uh, if there's any questions, as has been said before, uh, either uh, ask them at the end of, uh, of this slot or um, uh, uh, contact my, me directly. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Evie. That was um, really interesting. I um, Digital and paperless is clearly um, the world that we're moving towards. And so any solution that uh, means that we can speed up and yet keep safe and secure what we do is clearly something that the industry is going to be looking at moving forward. So thank you for your slides. No um, we're, we now, Leah, do we have Mark on the phone? Um, yes, I think we have Mark on the phone. Mark, can you hear us? I'll just see if we can hear him. Mark, can you hear us? Hello? Can you hear me now? Can you yes, hear me? we've we got can. you now. Great, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so Mark, to ourselves. Yeah, Mark, I'll just introduce you, okay? So, um, okay, yeah, yeah. So, Mark's joining us on the phone, uh, as he was about to say before I cut him off. Um, he can't get onto Zoom because of uh, security measures that are in place uh, at work. So, we've um, put together a slide here of the, the points that he's going to speak to. Um, Mark, don't think you'll be able to see this, but we can see these bullet points. Um, and we're, we're excited to hear from you. So, Mark's going to start Taylor is the specialist lifting engineer. Uh, he's a marine operations specialist at Total Energies, uh, and we're excited to hear from him now. So, Mark, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, like I say, apologies. It's Total Security Systems don't allow me to access Zoom. Uh, I think it's a French thing, but there you go. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Total CPO in the North Sea. Effectively, it's the TIA wall. But again, under the total regime, it's called a CPLO. Um, and I look after all the lifting operations. And one of the the big issues we have is inspection and ensuring the safe lifting operations. Uh, if you take the example of an onshore inspector, he turns up the site, £50 taxi, £100 room if he has to stay overnight. For us, the taxis are a few thousand pounds. The hotel beds are about a million pound a piece. So for us, one of the big issues is it's not the cost of the inspector or the inspection. It's the impact on our operating business. As I said, Total's goal is safe lifting operations, so therefore we have to do all the inspections. But inspectors need to turn up on the site with the understanding of the impact that they're going to have on operations. Stopping us for a deer isn't the same as stopping a factory for a deer. We're talking about, you know, a quarter of a million pound a deer on some sites, more on other sites, depending on the operations. So as your previous uh, person was discussing, the way of speeding things up, going to electronics, uh, base systems, is a good thing if we can save time. Because as said previously, time is money for us. And the cost of the inspectors is nothing compared to the cost of ongoing operations. We've had guys arriving on site. They don't have PPE. They expect us to supply them with the equipment they need to do their operations. Now, we can supply it, but that means a helicopter. 
take the equipment out or a supply boat, which takes a day to two days if we've got a sailing on that particular period. As I said, it's the impact on our operations, which is the biggest problem we have. And trying to get the OIMs and the managers to accept an inspection if we have delays like this causes so many problems. But it's a change in the philosophy of the inspectors. A lot of the inspectors are used to working on shore. Not a problem. You leave any equipment or you have to change, it's easy fix. Once you get on that helicopter, it's no longer an easy fix. It's no longer going to the shop and buying a new piece of equipment if something doesn't work or go and get the right piece of paper if they haven't bought it with them. So it, keep going on about this. But to us, it's the impact on the operation more than the cost of the inspectors. And that's not to say we're going to start paying anything to get an inspector out there because we have to save money as everybody else does. But it's the ongoing impact. And a lot of inspectors who are new to the industry do not realise the impact they're caused by what they are doing. Because offshore is a totally different environment from onshore. So if you come offshore with the, the, the philosophy of an onshore working practice, it doesn't work. Because our environment is different. And I think as part of the training and the induction of these guys to do inspection, that needs to be part of the, the training and the guidance that they're given. And unfortunately, some inspectors that we've had have taken on the job as an inspector because they see it as being easy money and an easy job without the experience and the knowledge that they need to do it. So we review our inspectors that go offshore to make sure that they meet our expectations because if they get offshore and they don't, then it causes problems. It's slightly different, but we had a rigger turn up uh, a few months ago, had every bit of paper when he arrived on, on site. We did checks on it, found out that he forged the papers. Historically, we've had the same across the lifting game. And it's easy for them to do PowerPoint and change it a certificate. It doesn't impact on them. But the impact it has on us, if we've got a demobiliser guy because he's turned up with the wrong paper, it's, it's astronomical in some cases. So the key thing for us is the right people, the right time and the right attitude and the right competencies to do the work. And as I say, that goes into the training and the development of these guys. And I'm not saying it's every inspection company, but we have had issues in the past. So, any comments? I'll be very interested from the inspection side of Leah to see what, what their view is on that kind of statement. So, Mark, we'll we'll take questions at the end of all the presentations. Yeah. Um, have, you, have you got anything else you want to contribute? And then we'll go to well, questions. Right well, the other end. thing is, it, it's slightly different, is grade, the grade of equipment we get. We are one of the few operators who specify that we will not accept grade 100. And again, this goes to the inspection of the equipment because we've had numerous issues with grade 100 equipment, so we do not allow anything beyond grade 80 because we cannot inspect it offshore. It, it, it ties in with the inspections because we were getting equipment that's come out with grade 100, which fails. Again, it's the different environment that we're working in offshore compared to onshore. Grade 100 in a factory in Aberdeen, anywhere in the UK, fine, not a problem. Grade 100 on an offshore environment does not work because our, the impact on the material for hydrogen embrittlement and all the other things associated with that. But it's, again, it's understanding that offshore environment is not the same as working in a factory onshore 
or on a building site on shore. You know, once you get on that helicopter on a supply boat, it all changes. Our priorities are different. Our conditions are different. And very few people, unless they are off hand, fully understand the implications of anything happening offshore with rigging operations, from inspection to the actual performance of lifting and rigging across the board. So I'm happy to take any questions on that. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Are you are you able to hang around, or do you need to leave us in the next few minutes? Uh, I can take some questions, but uh, this morning, again, things I, I plan things well in advance. But I've had several breakdowns this morning and several issues which I have to deal. With. So I can stay for a few minutes, but not long. Well, let's let's take your thank you so much. Thanks for making the time. I think we we all appreciate that you've squeezed this in. So thank you. So if we take if I put some questions to you now, Mark, and um, we'll, yeah. we'll break the we'll, we'll just go off the schedule slightly, Leah. Um, That's fine. So the questions that we've got in uh, are around Leah. Can you help me out? They're around uh, G one hundred. So yeah, Mark. Yeah. Uh, if I put these questions to you, um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's about grade hundred in particular. Um, uh, uh, can you see them? I've got some questions here. Yeah. Um, do you want to go for it? If yeah, you, if yeah. You... yeah. There's a question here from uh, Richard Oldno, um, who asks, um, "Hi, Mark. Is it about the control yeah. of the hardness on G100, not just the grade? Appreciate to understand your thoughts." Yes, it's it's predominantly the hardness because uh, we've dealt with a lot of suppliers and historically there is no control on the hardness of the material. Um, and the hardness has a direct relationship to the potential for hydrogen embrittlement. The harder the material, the more susceptible they are to hydrogen embrittlement. So if we do allow grade 100 on site, we have a limitation on the hardness to try and protect us from the potential failures which have, occurred, which have occurred worldwide with the harder grades of material, especially grade 100 and the, the grade 120, which is people starting to, to, uh, to market. So yes, it is directly related to the hardness of the material. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Are there any more questions for Mark at this stage? If there are, can you please pop them in the chat? Yeah, perfect. Just, just Mark, just talk to us a little bit more yeah. about um, the unqualified and fake certificates that you're seeing. Um, as part of our induction process on site, um, our law competent person reviews all the certificates that come on. And uh, we had a, a guy turn up, uh, it was about two months ago, and the review and the certificates, he was a, a, a rigger, and the certificate had his name at the top, all, all good. But as you read through the, uh, the certificate, there was a different name where they have on the certificate, this person attended this course on such and such. It was a different name. And when we contacted the training provider, uh, they came back and said, to our records, we have never had a person of that name attend any of our courses, and they have not paid any fees for courses either. So the person had never actually been to the training provider. So he got either a, a colleague or a friend or somebody give him a copy of a, a certificate from somebody else, and he'd done it. I must admit, it was a very good copy. You know, it was hard to see. And if he hadn't have had the wrong name on, we would not have identified it as being a problem because it was a, it was a proper certificate, signed and dated and everything. So we, con like I said, we contacted the, the trainer provider, and they confirmed that he'd never actually been there. 
Now, I know years ago we had a lot of problems with fake certificates, but I was rightly or wrongly over the years I thought we'd get around that because people were realising that they would be checked. But again, people will try and get work anywhere they can. Yeah. And they're all checked as a piece of paper. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Mark. I know um, here at Leah, we're spending a lot of time and money and making sure that our certificates are not fakeable. And certainly the industry will know that team cards have uh, both photos on them and they are instantly checkable uh, via the website. And also we've got a team of people that you can just get in touch and we can look at our records and come back to you there and then. But we're aware that it's an issue, uh, but... Um, but we, we hope that using technology, um, we certainly feel like we are ahead of that curve. Because um, if there's any job in the world that you don't want somebody doing, that they're not actually qualified and competent, I can't think of any much more than offshore inspector. That that feels like something that um, is the number one dangerous job. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we're careful to and certify and the right people and let them carry that with them. And um, Mark, thank you so much for yeah. your time. Have yeah. you got anything else you want to say? No, it's just that we, we totally agree with, with what you're saying about the certificates and making sure that they're right. And that's why we do have um, a process in place where we do check them. Uh, I'm not sure where everybody's in the same boat. Uh, I know that our controls and listing are slightly different from other operators, but it is a concern across the industry that we're still getting people thinking that they can just port copy things and turn up. It's not the way. Well, yeah. that's all I have. And it's, it's, been, it's been great to hear from somebody on the front line. So thank you so much for all your effort and joining us. Um, the other point to make is that really struck me was your point about um, the sort of the softer skills that an inspector has to have when they come offshore that they understand the impact that they are having on the, the business. Certainly uh, we at LEA, we've, we're just introducing a section in all of our trainings. Mm -hmm. um, inspectors understand the context in which they are inspecting and understand the impact on um, business. So, hey, look, it's great to hear from you. There's, there's a lot of love for you on the chat. So thank you so much for <laughs> taking the time. Um, we appreciate Not a problem. You. Sorry I couldn't do it otherwise. Uh, Zoom, but it's just security in our system is different no. from everybody else's. We we all understand. Perfect. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. And so right. uh, goodbye. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, sorry. Thanks, Mark. So moving on, um, uh, we've got our final speaker now. Uh, that is uh, the world famous Dave Tucker. Um, he's a senior training specialist from Leah. Uh, so you'll be able to see him uh, and he'll, he's in Huntington in one of our Zoom rooms that many of you will have uh, been involved in. Dave's going to speak to us about um, end user guidance. Before he, before he joins, um, end user guidance for us is important. It's an important way by which we can support our members uh, as they illustrate to end users the things that they must be doing. Um, so Dave's going to take some time, uh, wait, 10 minutes max, Dave. Dave's going to take 10 minutes to introduce us all to the end user guidance that we've been developing here at Leah. So Dave, over to you. Okay, thank you, Ross. Uh, can everyone hear me? Everyone see the screen? Yeah. Beautiful. Um, 10 minutes, take that with a pinch of salt. Um, Quite pleasing to see an awful lot of uh, people that have um, joined the meeting today, some ex-students in there, I say ex-students, students that have taught uh, in the past, um, and obviously a, a worldwide influence with people over in Trinidad, down to Southeast Asia and indeed beyond. Uh, also quite pleasing, some of the elements that have already been touched on by Mark and um, Evie, uh, some of which well, I might lightly touch back on again, let's not go down the road of competency. So uh, very, very brief, sweet, short to the point, aimed at you guys in the oil and gas and indeed the offshore industry. So the basic uh, learning outcomes up on, the, up on the screen there, completion of this short briefing, hopefully you will have gained a understanding of the responsibilities placed upon the duty holder. 
which is typically going to be the owner of the equipment itself, the, the installation suppliers, and indeed the end users, the people that are actually using the equipment regarding the lifted equipment used within the oil and gas industry and indeed the offshore environment. So looking to begin with at the duty holder. So typically the employer, it mentions up there, the self-employed person will concentrate on the person that actually owns the installation itself. Now, a very uh, powerful person, knowledgeable in certain areas, but they may not be knowledgeable in all particular areas. So they can delegate some of their responsibilities down to a subject matter expert, an SME, to a responsible person, or indeed possibly to an external organisation who can look after things like the lifting equipment and inspection itself. Now, this subdelegation typically goes down to a OIM, Offshore Installation Manager, um, as we've just mentioned previously there with Mark, um, if the duty holder themselves delegates any form of task downwards to the OIM, then they need to ensure that they're fit for purpose, so duly qualified and knowledgeable in all particular areas. Now, the OIM is going to be responsible for the particular installation itself with compliance to local rules, regulations, things like LOLA, PURE, also things like a offshore installation and pipe work and regulations. Now, again, that person themselves may not have the in-depth knowledge, so they can delegate downwards again. So the lifting equipment being looked after by a lifting equipment inspector, with the lifts themselves being planned, carried out by some form of APLO appointed person, whoever it may be. If the tasks are being delegated down, it does not remove the people above from their overall responsibility. So if something does go wrong, then um, the responsibility, the blame, if you like, can start going back upwards, depending on who's culpable or indeed who's liable. Correct selection of lifting equipment, something that Mark mentioned there um, uh, previously, is going to be based upon, as with all lifting operations, upon risk assessment, which is going to go through the roof, to, uh, especially considering the hazardous environments that you guys all work in. Um, first of all, to all national legislation of, around the world, regardless of where you may be, um, it needs to be capable of taking the loads that's going to be imposed upon it. Now, this is not putting the blinkers on, looking at the slings, the shackles, or indeed the hoist arrangement. This is also moving back up to things like your fixed points, your pad eyes, or indeed to the, the beam structure itself. Need to special considerations with regards to dynamic loading. So removing loads from a vessel up to a rig or indeed back down again, the susceptibility to dynamic or indeed shock loading across the lifting set, for example, on an offshore container. Potential wind speeds, temperatures, both hot and cold. Now this can be environmental temperatures. It could also be with regards to location of the equipment within the installation itself. The potential for snow and ice buildup, or indeed exposure to hazardous chemicals, environments, uh, which can be the, the vapors, the fumes, or indeed the liquids themselves. And certainly, as we mentioned previously, working offshore, the saline, the salt environment, that's when we start to experience hydrogen embrittlement in higher grades of equipment. Um, also, where the equipment's also going to be used can influence the correct selection with regards to immersion in salt water. So subsea um, hoist becoming very increasingly popular. An awful lot of manufacturers are moving down that route themselves and indeed the duty cycle or configuration of use. How often is it being used? How much is it lifting compared to its um, applicable rating? Also needs to be compatible to local legislation. Now in certain regions around the world, steel wire rope uh, with regards to aluminium ferrules have now been banned. Uh, certainly within the oil and gas industry, due to the potential risks or the hazards of thermite reaction or indeed thermite sparking. Regular inspection and maintenance programmes is absolutely massive. So it's ensuring uh, safety. We've already talked about the inspection side of life. It needs to be compliance to the maximum fixed periods. Now, these certainly here within the UK in accordance with Lola can be extended where there's a hazard or indeed access to the equipment could be an issue, but typically it can also be reduced, certainly with regards to accelerated corrosion that we experience when we're offshore. Maintenance carried out generally at the same time as the inspection, vitally important. First of all, it needs to be carried out by an appropriately qualified competent person and in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Regarding any form of maintenance, then uh, uh, a log or indeed data records must be kept afterwards, 
And the purpose of the maintenance itself is there to prolong life. It improves the efficiency of the equipment. It may also enable defects to be detected, which may have not been picked up through the inspection program itself. So overall, it's going to add or enhance to safety. When we look at maintenance, uh, maintenance can also be dictated by what the equipment is or indeed where it's being used. So in the offshore environment, subjected to seawater, salty water, the saline solution, and then heavy lubricant on steel wire ropes helps to jacket the rope up um, to protect it from that. You've got the same sort of hoist arrangement, steel wire rope being used out in the Middle East in the desert, and then heavy lubricant can start acting or attracting the sand, which can turn it into a cutting paste uh, accelerating um, defects within the wire rope itself. Suitable instruction and training to all members of staff. So first of all, we've got training for everyone. Workplace inductions. Now, workplace induction for office-based personnel working within an accounting department here in the UK mainland is going to differ from the induction program when working within the oil and gas industry. When we start stepping offshore, then we've got specific training, whether that's BOSIATS, uh, your basic offshore safety induction and emergency training, MIS training, giving you the mini, mini, uh, minimum, mini, mini, minimum industry safety training, or indeed, certainly very uh, pertinent to the oil and gas industry, we've got H2S training with regards to um, hydrogen sulfide with the detection, and then more importantly, uh, the response, the reaction to that. Uh, the training can be used uh, as a tool to reduce risk. It's a way to mitigate against risk. Also, it's a very, very good tool for ensuring competency with regards to certain um, personnel, with regards to activities, responsibilities uh, within the installation itself. The training, as we've mentioned, um, it needs to be suitable. So it needs to be a suitable training provider and indeed the trainer themselves need to be fit and qualified for, pers uh, for purpose. And again, I think we've already talked about people enhancing CVs, duplicate certification, something we're actively working at uh, here at Lear um, to remove. Moving into the suppliers, so the people that are going to provide us the equipment. First of all, they need to ensure that the equipment is going to be safe, fit for purpose, and will perform as intended. Now, it needs to be fit for purpose, typically built to standards. The most majority of standards, as Ben mentioned previously, are, um, I say optional, quasi-legal, designed for voluntary use. However, by working to the, uh, the standard, it does ensure or helps the manufacturer ensure legal, uh, legal compliance, not only back to the machinery directive itself, or indeed the supply machinery safety regulations here within the UK, but also to external or additional legislation, things like the International Maritime Organization, or indeed, the uh, Maritime Coast Guard Agency. Can it also include within the standard itself the requirement for enhancement factors? So we go back to the offshore uh, containers, for example. Within the standards themselves, when they're built, it requires an enhancement factor to be applied to the lifting set due to where it's being used and indeed the possibility to shock or indeed dynamic uh, overloading. The problem is, is people aren't aware of this or indeed they'll take a shipping container try to weld on some fabric, uh, fabricated pad eyes onto it, and then try to class it as an offshore container. Um, without laboring it too much, I've got a container downstairs that was in service, it's now a training aid. Um, it's got two lifting sets, both of which are not adequate to meet the requirements of the container once the enhancement factor has been applied. So then that comes back to the equipment itself, just because it's there and it's fitted, or indeed it has certain marking, then we need to make sure, again, that it's legally compliant. The manufacturers will test the equipment prior to, dis uh, to distribution, uh, which can include destructive or need non-destructive testing. This um, proves design quality, that it meets all of its legal obligations. And they also need to provide us with instructions for use, which can include essential conditions for the installation, how to use it safely, potential misuse, or indeed how not to use the equipment, with also inspection discard criteria and the essential conditions for maintenance. At the very bottom there, they need to provide us with updated information where it becomes known that the item gives potential risk or rise to or uh, poses a problem to health and safety. This could be a simple health and safety alert published on their website, or indeed could be complete product recall. 
Again, we work actively here at Lear within the website itself where we get HC alerts to publish them for you, the membership. Finally, the duties of us, the end user. So first of all, we've looked at the duty holder and indeed the supplier's uh, responsibilities. So first of all, we're gonna do as we're told, provided it does not lead to an increased risk to health and safety or indeed is an illegal act. So we need to do what the employer is telling us to do, provided we're suitably trained, qualified, and indeed in date with regards to the activities that are being required uh, from us. As a lifting inspector, I'm happy inspecting lifting equipment. I wouldn't feel very comfortable working on the, the rigging floor, uh, connecting pipe sections together, as opposed to a roughneck then coming out and start uh, stepping in and, and trying to do my job. We also have a responsibility to only use equipment for which we've received training instruction and to use it in the manner that we've been trained to use it. So suitable training programs are uh, provided with certain pieces of equipment. By following that training, it helps keep us safe and indeed the people around us safe. Even though we may be a, qu a competent, qualified person with years of experience, that doesn't enable us to start taking shortcuts, especially with regards to the environment where the equipment's being used. And then we've got that moral responsibility to look after ourselves and all others by our acts and omissions with regards to ethical, mature and indeed professional attitudes. By coming on and doing the right thing always, it keeps me safe, it keeps the people around me safe. If everyone else is working to the same attitude, then we all get to go home at the end of the day. It's also having the responsibility that if we see something going wrong, to step up and to stop the activity, quarantine it and then report it as necessary. As Mark alluded to earlier, uh, there could be the responsibility for us to step offshore to carry out an inspection. Well, then we need to have that professional attitude, be an ambassador for our company, something that Ange, uh, Andrew mentioned within the chat room itself. Um, be aware of who you are, your responsibilities and what you're doing. The lifting industry is vast and, and, and extensive, um, but very, very potentially dangerous, which is why we have sessions like this. I do apologise for the speed that that was delivered. Normally that would take me about an hour or two, um, but just trying to get us back on time. Uh, any questions I believe we're, we're, um, we're going to target at the uh, end of the session, but thank you for your time and attention. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave Tucker. Um, we are blessed at the association to have some wonderful trainers. Um, Dave is clearly one of them. He's my favourite, but then I tell them all that they're my favourites. But that, that was really useful. And just to make the membership aware that developing end user guidance was an important step forward for the association. It's important for us to let our end users know the things that they should be looking for. As Dave said in his presentation, many of them aren't aware of legal obligations. And when they do become aware of their legal obligations, they really look for quality and supportive uh, suppliers. And that, that's clearly something that the association uh, is keen to do. So we have now uh, exceeded our hour deadline. Um, so what we will do is we will look at the chat and we will distribute the questions that are aimed at the particular members of the panel to the panel. So Evie, you'll be getting some questions that we'll ask you and we'll provide you with details so that you can go back uh, to um, uh, back to participants. Uh, likewise, Ben, I think you've got some, and, and Mark will, will, will link up some people from Mark. Um, thank you so much for your time. I hope that there was something of use there and we will be doing uh, another one of these webinars on the 7th of July. It's aimed at the entertainment supply chain, the entertainment sector. The 7th of July is Global Lifting Awareness Day. Please jump on our website, see what that means, see how you can get involved. Um, but we look forward to working with uh, many of you moving forward. And a last shout out on the Leah Golf Day. If you are in the UK, the best day of the year is the Leah Golf Day. Uh, please think about putting in a team. Uh, it's the 30th of June. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you to Tewkesbury, just down in the Welsh borders there. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your participation. A special thank you uh, to our panellists, Evie, Ben, Dave and Mark. Thank you.